If you have your Bible with you, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, and so we're in chapter 41. You'll notice there are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis, and fully a quarter of them are devoted to the story of Joseph. And I think that the paragraph that we're going to unpack today has probably the strangest part of that story, because here is Here's Joseph, a foreigner. He comes to Egypt land as a slave. He's put in prison under accusation of improprieties with his former boss's wife. And, and in short, coming from the days when he wore the royal rainbow robe of his father, I think Joseph no longer recognized himself. Now let me open a window on that word because two years out of West Point, Lieutenant Sam Brown was on his first tour of duty when an IED turned his Humvee into a, a rolling Molotov cocktail, and he can't remember how he exited the vehicle, but he does remember rolling on the ground and slapping sand, sand on his burning face and running in circles, and finally he just dropped to his knees. He lifted his flaming arms to the sky, and he cried, Jesus, save me, because Sam was a believer in Jesus by being born again, and he was just calling on God to take him home. Death did not arrive, but his gunnery sergeant did and helped him reach cover behind a wall. And because of the pain, Sam ordered the man to take off his gloves. And of course, with the gloves came, came parts of his burning body. And finally, vehicles from another platoon arrived and they loaded him onto a truck. And he says before he passed out, he caught a glimpse in the side view mirror and Sam Brown did not recognize himself. That is Joseph after the last four chapters of Genesis. I count one broken promise, two betrayals, several assaults, two abductions, more than one attempted seduction, ten jealous bro brothers, and a major case of poor parenting. Foreigners with criminal records are usually not the ones to be considered for positions of power, much less if they are slaves, and yet all of that is about to change as Joseph is about to bounce. But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis of what, it, what I mean when I say he's about to bounce? You know, many of us have either played in or helped our children play in a bounce house. And a bounce house is an enclosure filled with air, so spongy that you can do superhuman things that only superheroes are allowed to do. So I want to explore this illustration for an explanation of what is happening to Joseph right now and what needs to happen to you now that you're at harvest. So first off, notice if you will, this is number one, a bounce house. In a bounce house, you can get knocked down and pop right back up again. I mean, inflated flooring and walls mean that when you get knocked down, if you fall just right, you can pop right back. You can go down, but not be down for long, because then on the other hand, and this is number two in a bounce house, you can fall on your knees and get up standing. People do their best to push you and trip you and level you, but if you land on your knees, you can, you can end up standing. And this is number three. There's no way to stay flat if people are jumping around you. So you have more comeback than even our boys in blue who took the crown last year. And you don't have to be strong because what you're landing on is full of air. And yet when people around you are jumping, then something within you cannot stay still. So we do well to learn from Joseph's secret in this chapter because here's our thesis for today's study. Nightmares only come true if you let the world interpret your dreams. Trials will either make or break your relationship with God. And if they're not going to break you, you've got to use God's providence to give you divine perspective on his plan. So do not allow the world and worldlings to interpret what is happening to you. The answers you seek are only going to be found in the word, not in the world. The world can't show you nothing. Why are you looking there anyway? Okay, watch. Genesis 37, 1729 B.C. 1729. Genesis 41, 1715 B.C. That's, that's 14 years go by. So whenever Pharaoh calls Joseph out of the dungeon in verse 14 of chapter 41, that's the third time in 14 years Joseph's got to give up his coat. 
His brother stole his coat of many colors. Potiphar's wife grabbed his coat as, as he was fleeing. And now the third time is the charm because this time Pharaoh is exchanging Joseph's prison garb for a royal garment, a robe, a signet ring, a gold chain, a new name, and a wife. He starts off, Joseph does, in his father's house, hated by his brethren. Now he's elevated in Potiphar's house. Then he's sentenced to the prison house. But now he's going to bounce. He is large and in charge. Getting ready to take charge of Pharaoh's house. I'd call that bouncing back. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Alan, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm glad we're getting to the good part. You took too many weeks to go through all that other stuff going on in Joseph's life. And, and I don't know if I feel like I've been in a bounce house, but sometimes I feel like I've been Bozo, the bouncy clown man. And, and you know that bouncy clown Bozo that has the big bottom? He, that's what makes the world go around, is the big, big bottom clowns. And, 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 and when I'm facing flying fists of rejection and the right hook of unexpected loss and the left jab of betrayal, then I've, I, you know, I've even been sucker punched and slandered and enemies have hit me below the belt and calamities have caused me to stagger. Crises, crises have made my life a slugfest. Sometimes I get knocked down. And I'll be honest with you, Alan, I don't want to get back up again. So, so if I were honest, I would admit I came, I came in here to today wanting to just stay on the mat. I've been on the mat too long, Alan. I don't even know why I came here today. I'm broken and beaten. I'm believing I'm down for the count. So don't let me leave here till you show me. How can I bounce? I may not be back, but I want to come back. And even if I go down, then let me go down swinging. Oh, I may not win this round, but I want the Lord to find me trying. So I'd be glad to help you out today. Give me a minute to unpack this passage. We'll clothe ourselves with this truth, get our healing, and head out of here looking for somebody to bring with us next Sunday to see life through glasses of gratitude. But let me take you to our text where we find Joseph bouncing back. The angry jealousy of his brothers sold him into slavery. The below-the-belt lie of Potiphar's wife landed him in prison. The butler's broken promise kept him incarcerated for two more years. Somehow Joseph staggered, but he kept bouncing back. You need to cue the Rocky. Rocky movie music right here because God pulled him up and stood him stronger than ever right in the court of Pharaoh. Let me borrow the screen of your anointed imagination and let's reprise what got us to this spot because here's, here's Pharaoh, bare-chested and rock-jawed. I mean, his pecs are a little saggy, but, but he's solid for a middle-aged monarch and he wears this cloak covering his shoulders, and on his head is this leather cone, which seems kind of odd, but leather cone, and it's encircled by a, a rearing cobra. Looks like it's ready to strike. His beard is fake, but his eyeliner is almond-shaped, and he holds a staff in one hand and rests his chin on the other, and slaves are fanning the air around him and swatting the flies and the, and, and the mosquitoes coming at him, and there's a bowl of figs and nuts on the table right in front of him, and a flagon of wine next to that. But this particular day, he's not hungry. He just frowns as he contemplates the king's great matter. His attendants whisper in anxious, subdued voices because everybody in here knows when Pharaoh ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Nightmares kept him up half the night. In, in dream one, seven cows, fat and fine. I mean, they were prime candidates for a Chick-fil-A commercial. <laughs> they graze on the riverbanks of the Nile, and as those healthy bovines are chewing their cuds, seven skinny cows sneak up behind them. They devour them and look none the more nourished for doing it. Pharaoh is startled out of sleep. He sets up in bed. He breaks out in beads of sweat. After a few minutes, he dismisses the dream, falls back asleep again, but dream two is just as bothersome. Here's a stalk of grain. It, says it has seven healthy heads of grain on it, and yet it's consumed by a stalk of grain with seven withered heads. And two dreams with a similar pattern because seven, seven bad things consume seven good ones. 
Pharaoh wakes up. He's distracted and befuddled. He assembles his high command at O Dark 30. He demands of them an interpretation. Everybody's confused, and then suddenly the chief butler, who's filling up the coffee, coffee cups, starts to shake. And he's, he's shaken, and his voice cracks as he nervously remembers Joseph from back in the day. So Butler tells Pharaoh about this Hebrew kid who had skill in dream interpretation, and the king snaps his finger, and a flurry of activity ensues. In a moment of high drama, Jacob's favored son enters Pharaoh's throne room, and don't miss the contrast. Pharaoh, current king of Egypt, Joseph, former shepherd from Canaan land. Pharaoh, utterly urban. Joseph, completely rural. Pharaoh from the palace. Joseph, fresh from prison. Pharaoh wore gold chains. Joseph just got out of iron chains. Pharaoh with armies and pyramids. Joseph with a borrowed coat and a foreign accent. But once he heard the dream, he went straight to work. No, no reason to consult advisors or horoscopes or coins or divination. This is straightforward walking in the spirit stuff. Like basic math for a fifth grader, Joseph tells Pharaoh, look, God is showing you what he's about to do, not just for you, not even just for your country, but what is going to take place across this planet. This could mean the extinction of the human race. Expect seven years of overabundance, and then seven years of absolutely nothing. Nobody, including Pharaoh, knew how to react. The king's draw dropped so, dropped so far, his, tea, his wooden teeth fell on the floor. Famine was a foul, four-cornered hieroglyph in the Egyptian language. The, their nation did not manufacture chariots to, to, to export. They didn't make togas for the Greeks. Their entire economy was based on being the breadbasket for the rest of the world. Crops made Egypt the queen of the Nile. Uh, agriculture made Pharaoh the most powerful man on the planet. A month-long drought would cripple the economy. A year-long famine would probably topple his throne. But a seven-year cycle of global warming? That would turn the Nile into a dry creek bed and their crops into sticks. Pharaoh views famine like the Saudis look at electric cars. I mean, it's an apocalypse. And, and, and the silence in the palace was so thick, you could hear a cough drop. But then Joseph not only gave the interpretation, he also gave the answer. He said, look, all you got to do is create a department of agriculture, commission your best leader to gather the extra grain in those seven fat years, because then you can retail it to the rest of the world in the seven lean years. Now, the, the courtiers gulped at Joseph's chutzpah. I mean, it's one thing to give bad news to a good leader. You don't ever do that. But then, then to offer unsolicited advice. I mean, this, this farmer straight out of the pen shows no hint of fear. He had faith in God's promise to him, so he knew he was made for this moment. But the question from the pulpit today is, how about you? How do you see what has happened to you? How do you look at what has brought you here today? Joseph offers no accolades to the magicians and astrologers. He doesn't apply kinesiology. He doesn't look at the grounds in nobody's coffee cup. He doesn't dissect no, no animal liver. He doesn't pay attention to which way the birds are flying. Lesser men would have cowered and they would have compromised, but Joseph did not. How about you? When you stand before the grand exalted Puba of the pyramid people. How do you react? Pharaoh's the unrivaled ruler of the land. He's, he's his own cabinet in Congress. He speaks the word and it's done. He, he makes the command and it's law. He enters the room and he's worshipped. And yet today, Pharaoh doesn't feel worship worthy. Here's the lowest person on the pecking order, an ex-prisoner named Joseph, and he's cooler than a polar bear's toenails. And Pharaoh's the one who's nervous. And what we see today, and this is our first point for study, what makes the difference in how God uses you is what you have on the inside. Inside, do you have confidence in God's providence? Inside, do you have faith in God's grace? See, there's a word for this. It's, it's the word ballast. So let me hit you with this definition. Because ballast 
is a counterweight placed low in a vessel in order to improve stability. Every bozo, bouncy clown has a, a ballast. It's the thing that makes weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. There's a lead weight on the inside. There's a plate that's hidden in the base. It serves as ballast, so no matter how hard they hit you, you have to bounce back. No matter how low they lay you, you leap back up again. Joseph has this anchor on the inside, and it's not a piece of metal, M-E-T-A-L, but it is metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. He has iron in his soul from the years of being shackled to it. And that trust gave him a deep-seated, stabilizing faith response to the crises of life. And you got to get this before you go. Watch, verse 16, Genesis 41, verse 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It's not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer apiece. And then from verses 25 to verse 32, four times in eight verses, Joseph makes reference not to himself but to God. When Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, Joseph asked, how can, I sin, how can I do this and sin against God? When fellow prisoners ask for an interpretation of their dream, he says, look, don't interpretations belong to God? Because here's our second point for study. Joseph locked the magnet of his compass on the recognition of divine activity. God's word is going forth from this church. That's a recognition of divine activity. The Holy Spirit is moving in our midst. That's a recognition of divine activity. People are responding to the Word and the Spirit. That's a recognition of divine activity. So we can chart our direction for the future based on an acknowledgement of divine activity. Why? Because it's not in any one of us. It is God giving us the answers. Joseph lived with an awareness of the providence of God. God is able. God is active. And you know what? God is up to something in your life. You didn't just accidentally come here today. God sent you here because God is up to something in your life. So before I let you go, can I take a minute just to show you how to bounce? Anybody want to hear this today? Just say, I'm hyped for this, Alan. I'll even take silence as consent because I know you don't always like to show people that you're high key for something. So, so if you want to get unstuck, if you want to start moving again with the Lord, if you want to come back from your setback, then first off, notice if you will, this is number one. You must get your sense of balance from your ballast on the inside. Let the whole church say ballast. Look at verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is? A man in whom the Spirit of God is. This boy from the boondocks. This, this brother been knocked down, but got back up again. So much so that he's talking about the apocalypse like that ain't no thing but a chicken wing. I mean, Joseph not only interpreted the problem, he lays out a grand solution so Pharaoh says, look, if that's the job description, aren't you the one we need for this? Put this man in his own chariot, rolling on 24s. What an unexpected rebound to the chaos of Joseph's life. But, but if you've got ballast, what do you get? You get balance on the outside from the ballast on the inside. Can I give you just a bit of ballast this morning? I think we might have put these references on your handout, Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Ballast. No, Nehemiah 8.10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Ballast. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy paths. Ballast. Psalm 84, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and mercy. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. But ballast. M Matthew chapter 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's ballast that gives you balance on the inside. But then second, second on the other hand, to bounce back from your setback, and this is number two, You've got to get your sense of safety from confidence in God's sovereignty. Look at verse 39. 
And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there's none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. You've you been over Potiphar's house. You've been over my Potiphar's house. You've been over my, my praise warden, my uh, prison warden's house. I need you over my house. And let me get the advantage of that. And according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Jacob's forgotten son becomes second most powerful person in the world's most powerful country. And his path to the palace was not painless. But God took that mess and made something meaningful out of it because he had confidence in God's sovereignty. And in that way, Joseph got a sense of protection and preservation from his confidence in God's providence. Then in the final analysis, and this is number three, you must get your sense of significance from honoring the God you acknowledge. We too often refuse to operate from a position of confidence in God's providence. And instead of confidence, we like to complain. Hello, somebody. Then our complaining grieves the Holy Ghost, and so it cancels out his comfort and his collaboration in our pain. You need to tally up right now all the pain of your past. You need to add up all the betrayals. All the anger, all the frustration, all the false starts, all the failed attempts, and then you need to multiply that by all the tragedies, all the poor parenting, all the accusations, all the abuse, all the lies. And then you need to ask yourself, is, jo is Joseph's God my God yet? Because if he is, this is our third point for study. God can use the attack the devil intended to destroy you as energy employed to develop you for his eternal purpose. And it may not be today, but it'll be someday that you will tally up all the crud at the end of your life and you'll write Christ as the sum at the end of that equation. Because God will use the attack intended to destroy you as energy employed to develop you for his eternal purpose. But I know just where I lost you because it's an emotional story. It's almost too much. Story of Lieutenant Brown. The pain chart didn't have a number high enough to register his agony. Sam Brown spent three years undergoing dozens of surgeries where dead skin was removed and healthy skin was harvested and, and, and grafted. And yet in the midst of all that, all that ugliness, beauty walked in. Amy Larson was a dietitian, And since Sam's mouth had been reduced to the size of a quarter, she monitored his nutritional intake, but the most important thing from Sam's perspective is she didn't flinch when she saw him. So after a few weeks, he asked her out, and she told him about the first time she noticed him. He was lying in ICU, covered in bandage, bandages in a chemically induced coma, attached to a ventilator. She stepped in the, into the room after he got conscious in order to meet him, but he was surrounded by family and doctors, so she just walked out. Early in their relationship, Sam brought up Jesus. Amy was not a believer at the time, but Sam's testimony stirred her heart. And he talked about God's mercy in spite of his misery. How he had suffered much, but Jesus suffered more for their sins. He was able to lead her to Jesus Christ with his witness. They got married, and Sam now has a program to aid wounded warriors. And I don't see why you're not getting this, because... God's math always adds up differently than ours. Tragedy plus trial plus verbal abuse t multiplied by bullying and unjust incarceration add two more years of prison rations and it equals saving his family and saving the rest of the world. So I don't know just who I'm preaching at today, but God wants you to have a rebound revival. And because this is so important, can I just go ahead and leave you with four non-negotiable necessities for a rebound revival? Let me summarize this study by pulling, pulling out some principles from a different angle in order to help you stop being stuck and move forward for God. First, this is letter A. All of us need freedom. But the most important freedom is what you have in Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying you don't feel circumscribed by your circumstances. I'm not saying you don't feel bound by your situation and locked up by your condition. But no matter what your state, 
Your standing is one of freedom to be like Christ. I don't care what you're in or what you're going through. You still have a free will, and nothing prevents you from becoming more like Christ-like except your own choices. So second, letter B, all of us need respect. But the most important factor is to respect yourself because you are living in the will of God. Okay, I'm going to make a statement that if you're taking notes, you ought to write this down. Emotional healing comes to your life when you follow God's will and let him sort out the consequences. I just gave you the answer. Don't stop taking your medication, but I did just give you the answer. (laughs) Emotional healing comes when you follow God's will and then let him sort out the consequences. Nobody can say you won't get hurt again. Nobody can tell you you won't be let down again, but follow God and let him be in charge of the outcomes. And then third, this is letter C. All of us need success, but the most important achievement is to gain God's approval. Do not violate Bible principles in order to be accepted by other people or keep their friendship. It just ain't worth it. Because 1 Timothy 1.5 says, now the end of the commandment, the result, the result of following Bible principles is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. Nothing will give you inner strength like a pure heart, good conscience, and unfaked faith. Fourth, and in the final analysis, this is letter D. All of us need relationships, but your most important companion is still the Holy Spirit. All of us need accountability, but only the Holy Ghost is with you 24-7, 365. If you get saved today, then God in Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, will never leave you nor forsake you. Not only that, but when you pray, he will answer you in his word. Go ahead and stand and grab your neighbor by the hand. You know, I believe God can exceed our greatest expectations. I don't even know what to expect, being 120% of capacity. We have people. You say, Alan, well, it looks full around here. What do you mean 120%? We have people in room six. That's our overflow. And so we got people in room six watching this in here. And, uh, you know, and there's always something that doesn't work out, right? The sound doesn't sound quite right. This doesn't go quite right. That doesn't go right. And people still come. I don't, I don't even know what to expect. All I know is God can exceed our expectations. So I know how they hurt you, but stop sitting on the sidelines. Let God bring you a rebound revival. I, I know you got let down, but let's lift Christ up. Joseph started the day in prison. He ended the day in the palace because God will always exceed Everything you can expect. Let me call a witness. Noah, preaching righteousness, was given an ark to escape the flood. Abraham, wandering homeless, was given title deed to a land. Moses, facing Pharaoh's chariots, was given a rod to part the Red Sea. Joshua, fighting Jericho, was given a shout to make the walls fall flat. David, in the valley with Goliath, was given a rock to make him roll. The three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace were given an audience with the Son of God. Daniel in a den of lions was given a good night's sleep on a sleep lion bed. And Jesus, Jesus, crucified for your sins, was given resurrection out of the grave. You don't even have to go that far. I can testify. God has stood by my side and been my guide. And I'm afflicted sometime, but God uses the chisel of affliction to sculpt my soul. I feel weak sometime. No, I feel weak all the time. But God uses my weakness to deepen my dependence. And then the weaker I feel, the harder I lean. And the harder I lean, the stronger my ballast. And the stronger my ballast, the better I get back up again. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray. If you're down, get up today. If you're weak, look to the strong one for your strength. 
If you want to if you want to let go, hold on. If you want to give up, hold out. We serve a God who can give you a rebound revi- revival. But you know what? In order to get that from God, you've got to give God yourself. And if you're in here today and you have not yet been born again, by giving yourself to God, by saying, God, save me for Jesus' sake. Save me for what he did on the cross for me. There's no message like that. I've studied comparative religions. No other religion has a message like that that would say you can come to Jesus and get eternal life because as God, he paid the penalty for your sins on the cross. Take advantage of that today just by praying and say, God, save me. Just just the, the prayer even that Jesus described that the publican had, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, And if you pray that and mean that, you'll know that the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. He'll save you. You'll be born again. He'll give you eternal life. And then we can teach you how to walk with God. And if you'll come up here when we get done praying, I'll give you a copy of my book on next steps for new believers. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it has spoken to us. Lord, I didn't put anything in this passage. It was not there. So, Lord, I know it's not in me. It is only God that can interpret a person's life for them and show them how he has brought them to this spot so they could start serving him anew and afresh with a rebound revival. God, give us that, not because we're worthy, but because Jesus died to produce that. Lord, we trust in his finished work and ask that, Lord, you would lead us, go beyond our expectations for what you have for us to do through the vision of this church. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.